So just to remind you, dual vector space is defined as a set of linear functions, the space of linear functions on a given vector space, right? We define this. So suppose the vector space S is given. You define S tilde, which is the set of all linear functions on S. And then uh, you, you define the rule of addition of the linear, linear functions, multiplication by numbers, etc. And we showed that that was a vector space, right? And furthermore, we showed that it was exactly n-dimensional. So the same dimension as the uh, dimension of S, right? which is a bit strange because you would imagine the space of functions infinite dimensional. But the point is it's not arbitrary functions. Those are linear functions. Linear function is a very, very strong restriction, right? That's why it becomes finally only n-dimensional. And finally, uh, in the case where a scalar product is defined in the original vector space S, then there is a, a natural map, a one to one map between S and S tilde. So you can associate to a vector S a vector in S tilde. Okay? So we said, I mean, so, um, uh, so we have S tilde, which was the, the set of linear functions. on S, where S is an n-dimensional vector space. And then the first thing we showed was S tilde is also n-dimensional. Right? And you remember how we showed it. We just constructed a basis for S tilde. Right? Uh, so if, let's say, I are the basis i going from 1 to n is a basis for s. Then we defined, uh, we defined a basis for s tilde. We defined a linear functions which, which we called fi. These are linear functions. And they are defined by the following conditions. fi acting on j is delta ij. Right? This is just a, I mean, I, I just, Shows. It doesn't have to be like that. You could choose any basis, as you know. Given a vector space, if I choose one basis, you may choose another basis, right? So, but this is just a convenient basis. Right? Uh, and uh, then this i again goes from one to n, and we showed that this, in fact, is a basis for uh, meaning any vector, any linear function can be expanded as linear combinations of these f i's, right? That is so, uh, and we showed also that these f i's were linearly independent of each other. Right? So therefore, that is how we proved that this has the same dimension. Okay. Finally, uh, if a scalar product is given, you see, I want to emphasize, for the, to define the dual vector space, you don't need scalar product in the original vector space S. Even without a scalar product definition in the original vector space, you can always define S tilde. There's no problem. Right? However, if a scalar product is given to you, if a scalar product exists or is defined, on S, if, if a scalar product is defined on S, then for every vector A, I can associate a, a, a particular vector, a vector in S tilde, we can give a map, one-to-one -one map. For A, I define a vector in S tilde, which we will denote always like this. So this is a notation. I'm just denoting. I'm saying there is a map, a unique vector. I mean, given a vector A, there is a unique vector in S tilde. I can give a map like that. Okay? And I will denote that vector by A. This is a notation. Um, so in, in specifically, uh, what will be A? A will be, uh, I can write this A as, uh, uh, I think, uh, A i f i summed over i. Okay. So this is a, this is a map. So you see, for a, for a given A, I associate a particular vector in S tilde, which is this. I, I define this vector. And I just call this as a, that. Okay? Where, what is this? This is the scalar product, which is, which is given, which is being defined. Okay? That's a scalar product between A, the vector A, and the basis vector I. Okay? It will be some number, some complex number. I mean, that, is, that goes into the de definition, the way you have defined the scalar product. But once you have defined, then this will be some complex numbers, right? And I'm just adding, uh, taking linear combination of fi's with these complex numbers, multiplying these complex numbers. So that will be some vector in S tilde, some linear function, right? 
And what, what I'm saying is that this, so I will uh, give an association. This vector will be associated with that dual vector. And this one, I just give a notation. I call that as A. Okay. Uh, note that this map is anti-linear map. Anti-linear map. Why? Because suppose I had taken, um, uh, so uh, say A is mapped to that, right? Now let's ask the question, what happens to alpha A? Where is that map to? Alpha is again a vector of S. You can ask what, where does it map to? Well, we again apply the same formula. So this will be mapped to some i equal to 1 to n. Um, you see a i, but remember what is a i is the same as i a complex conjugate. right? The scalar product satisfies that condition. But now you see instead of a, I have alpha a. Okay? So it will be, so in other words, it's i alpha a. Right? Alpha is a number. But remember, uh, uh, this is linear. This is linear. So you get here i equal to 1 to n. Alpha i a, whole thing complex conjugate. Because the complex conjugate is over everything. Right? Times f i, which is the same as, OK, you take the complex conjugate, so you get i equal to 1 to n alpha bar. OK? And then complex conjugate of i a is by definition again a i f i. So you see alpha bar comes out, and what was what is remaining is simply the a. Right? So this is the same as, I mean the dual vector a. So this is the same as alpha bar dual vector a. So you see, if a is mapped to that, then alpha times a is mapped to alpha bar times a. So in that sense, it's an anti-linear map. Uh, this map. But it's a one-to-one -one map. It's a one-to-one -one map. It's a natural map uh, once you give a scalar product. This is the reason why in quantum mechanics you will see that whenever you go to the, the so you have, you have a ket state. When you go to the bra state, you have to take the complex conjugation. Right? That is the reason. Okay. I mean, you, you will see that in more detail in quantum mechanics course. Right? But, um, all right, so now, uh, so th th is there any question on this? F please feel free to ask questions and don't be shy. Okay, and so now what I will do is, uh, yeah, there are, um, there are two things. Uh, so then towards the end of uh, last lecture, we also showed that given the definition of scalar product, uh, the scalar product satisfies the cauchy schwarz inequality. That was, that was an important point. So let me go back now. This was just to remind, uh, uh, because I'm afraid that this is a little abstract. Hmm? This definition is a little abstract, but you will get used to it. Hmm? Okay. Uh, so uh, the main uh, so the scalar product, the main property was uh, for any two vectors a and b, uh, we had this that uh, we had this was a complex number. This this so this is just a notation. A scalar product between a and b, it's a it's a complex number, which satisfies the condition that a b is the same as complex conjugate of b a. There was one thing. And the second point, second important point was that A, A, uh, this is linear. I mean, second is, is a linear in this, in this argument. So in other words, if C is equal to alpha B plus uh, beta uh, D, uh, beta D, let's say. Alpha A, A, C. Yeah? I mean, it's just, I just chose some combination, right? Uh, then A with C is the same as alpha A with B plus beta a b t. Okay. So that's a linear condition. But of course, it, by using the fact that when you exchange the order, it becomes complex conjugate. It, from here, it, it also implies that it will be anti-linear in the second ar argument. Hmm? Linear in the first argument, uh, I mean this argument, but anti-linear in this one. Hmm? Just taking the complex conjugate, you'll see. OK. Uh, and the third one, very important property, uh, was a a. Well, by this, it immediately follows that it is also the complex conjugate of that. Right? So that means it's real. 
but it, so for sure this is real. But what we are saying is that actually it is non is a positive. I mean non negative is greater than or equal to zero, and it is zero, and this is zero if and only if a is a null vector. Only in that case it is zero. Otherwise it's strictly positive. And it's from these things we proved the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Which was a statement that if, if I give you two vectors, so A, B, scalar product, mod, modulus of that is less than or equal to the square root of A, A, and B, B. This is the analog of what we saw in, what we already are familiar with in uh, the usual vectors. No? If you take two vectors, the dot product of that will be the length of one vector times the length of the other vector times the cosine or the angle between the two, right? So since cosine is, all, modulus of cosine is always less than or equal to one, therefore from that you know that the dot product is going to be always, I mean modulus of dot product is always going to be less than the length, product of the length of the two vectors, less than or equal to. It will be equal to only if they are parallel or anti-parallel, right? Only in that case, otherwise it will be always. So this is just that. Huh? You see, so what we are saying is that with this, just this, these definitions, it follows this property. Question. Yeah. Maybe from how we derived the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, where was the C coming from? How did you pick the, the C? Ah, this is the thing. Uh, yeah, good. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, so, right, I mean, that is a... That is a trick, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah, true. It is not immediately obvious that this is how you should start, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Not immediately obvious. Um, yeah, it's not obvious, but I mean, uh, many times that happens. You see, in, a, in a giving a, a proof of some theorem, uh, the starting point is not immediately obvious. I mean, that is where the great mathematicians, you know, do some work. <laughs> uh, you need some special way of thinking about things to, right, to be able so to we prove. Just, we just yeah, I mean the starting point. Yeah, that is that's the way it is. I don't know if there's some other way of proving it. I mean, maybe there exists some other ways of proving it. Huh? Is um, uh, one has to think about it. If there is some other way, other route to prove the same thing. But um, yeah, sometimes, many times, uh, proving the theorem, it's almost obvious. This is how you should start. But in this case, yeah, it is not obvious where, how, why, why the mathemat, whoever proved this for the first time, why he even thought about this. No, yeah, it's not obvious. Uh, okay, so this was one. Uh, then um, you're also familiar with another property in, uh, in, in from our usual uh, uh, usual experience with the vectors, right? Uh, if I take a, in a plane two vectors, let's say this vector and uh, uh, so that vector, let's say, okay, then we know that uh, if I uh, take the so this is say a and that's b, then the sum of the two vectors is this. We have to draw the parallelogram. Okay, uh, and this is the vector. Right? This is a plus b. Okay, so of course this is a, and I mean these two are parallel, so this is also b, right? This vector. Right? So the triangular inequality says that the length of this is going to be less than or equal to the sum of these two lengths, right? That is a triangular inequality. So the length of uh, length of a plus b is less than or equal to the length of a plus length of b. Right? It will be equal, of course, if b was parallel to a. Right? In that case, uh, they, they just add up. So the a plus b will be simply the length of a. But if there is a, if they're not parallel, then uh, it will be always less than or equal to a plus b. Right? That's the Yeah. 
So let's see how do you prove that. Huh? Uh, now, so this is true, but now we want to sh show that just from these definitions that we gave, these abstract definitions that we gave for the scalar product, right? I mean, this is a particular example, right? This is a particular, on the plane, okay, we know that this is what happens, right? But now we want to show that in general, these definitions that we have given, they will also, with that definition again, the scalar product will satisfy this, this condition. That's what we want to prove. Okay, so, so let's uh, so, so try to prove that. So let's say suppose I'm given a vector A and a vector B. Then of course I, I ask the question what happens to A plus B, the, the, the length of that, okay? The length of this. The length, remember what is the length? The length is simply given by that. Length of A is uh, simply this, square root of that, right? I mean this is A with A scalar product is like A square, the length square. I mean that would be what you would do, get there. And the square root of that is the length. Right? So we define this as a length. Of the vector a. Hmm? Yes. So I want to take the length of this. So length of this guy. Okay. So uh, let me just call it. Give it a name. So this is a, this is some vector c. C is a plus b. Right. So what I want to compute, I want to compute c with c. First of all, and then take the square root. So this will be length square hmm? of the vector c. So let's first compute that. That will be the same as c with a plus b. So C A plus C B, I just use a linearity here because this C is A plus B. So I just use a linearity, right? Then again, I use the linearity here. So I will get here A A plus B A plus A B plus B B, right? I just, I mean, this, has, this is a sum of these two terms and that is a sum of those two terms, right? Because C is A plus B. I mean, since this is so, therefore C is also equal to A plus B. So, so what is this? This is this is the um, A A plus B B plus. So you see, you have A B plus B A, but B A is the complex conjugate of that. Right? So this quantity is two two times the real part, real part of AB, right? What is the real part? I mean, in general, if I give you a complex number Z, this will be some uh, real number plus I times some other real number, right? This is general complex number. So the real part of Z is the X, and the imaginary part of Z is Y. So since I have, so let me call this as Z, then this will be Z, this is a complex conjugate, this will be Z bar. Z bar will be X minus IY. So when you add them up, IY will cancel, and you will just get two times X. So it's two times the real part of it. Okay. So that's the first step. Uh, but, so this I can derive again as, this is going to be less than or equal to, okay. You see, this is a real part of AB, right? But I can write it in this way. This is going to be less than or equal to two times the magnitude of AB, correct? I mean, what is the magnitude of Z? What is the magnitude of Z, complex number? It is simply square root of X squared plus Y squared, correct? So. Uh, now, what we are saying is a real, uh, this is two times the real part of uh, Z. So, this guy is two times X. Uh, uh, so, okay. So, uh, the point is that this is greater than or equal to X, right? Isn't it? I mean, we have a square root of X square plus Y square. This is going to be greater than or equal to the magnitude of X, correct? Because you have, a, I mean, if Y was not there, then square root of X square is exactly equal to modulus of X, right? But now I'm adding some positive number because y square is a positive quantity, right? The square of any number will be always positive. Right? So you're adding something to what was before. So this is going to be greater than or equal to that. It'll be equal if y was zero, right? Otherwise, it's going to be generally greater. So what I, that's what I've done. Um, I have replaced this by this quantity, the absolute, the absolute value. This is just a real part of that, right? Of this complex number. 
Now I'm taking the absolute value of that complex number. So this is going to be greater than or equal to that. Right? So therefore, this whole thing is going to be greater than or equal to that. OK. Now I use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. We already know the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for that. Right? So let's see. So Cauchy-Schwarz inequality says that the absolute value of AB is less than or equal to square root of AA times BB. Right? So I just uh, use this here. So we find that this, if, so from this we find that CC is less than or equal to AA plus BB plus two times. Now we have absolute value of AB, but that is going to be is less than or equal to that. So I just substitute this here. So you get here AA times BB. I mean, uh, uh, this whole thing is going to be greater than or equal to that whole thing, right? But this is already greater than or equal to CC, right? So therefore, we all, so CC is also less than or equal, equal to this quantity. But this guy is a whole square. This guy is nothing else but square root of AA plus square root of BB whole square. If you take the whole square, I mean, just open the open the bracket. So the square of that, which is this, plus square of that, which is that, and then the cross product two times this times that, which is that. So this is this. So we have, we have come to this conclusion that CC is less than or equal to that. And that's what we wanted to prove. We just take the square root on both sides, right? So this implies the square root of CC, which is the length of C, is less than or equal to the length of A. plus the length of B. This is the triangular inequality. Okay. I mean, this is uh, possible because, I mean, yet, because these are all positive quantities. That's why this is true. I mean, if this was somehow this is negative, if there were negative quantities, then you cannot write like this. But since you know that every single term here is positive, I mean non-negative, right? so you can take the square root on both sides. Okay, is that clear? I mean, all right. So that's a triangular inequality. Um, now we go to uh, okay. There's uh, something. Yeah. A a any question here? Because then I can erase. If you don't have any question, I can er erase that part. Yes, okay. No questions? All right. I mean, the purpose of this is to show that the, uh, the scal our scalar product that we have defined is a, I mean, makes perfect sense. I mean, it satisfies all the intuition that you have from the plane, from the you know, vectors on the plane. <laughs> They satisfy all these conditions, right? But now you see that even, even in general, this definition satisfies these conditions. Okay. Now, another notion is, uh, you know, if you take, a, say, a plane, for example, uh, you have, say, various points, right? I mean, take a, a point here, a point here. Uh, given a point, you can always draw a vector, right? Starting from the origin, you can draw a vector like that, a vector like that. But you have a notion whether these two points are near or far, right? Well, how, do you, how do you say given two points, are they near or are they far from each other? Well, all you do is you just compute the distance of these two, distance between the two, right? If the distance is small, you say they're near. If the distance is large, you say they're far, right? So there's a notion of closeness, you know? What's the distance between two vectors? Between two points is the same as between two vectors because given a point, I know, I can write. I can draw a vector, right? So how close are two vectors? How far they they are? That depends on the distance, right? But which distance? It's this distance. So if if I give you a vector a, vector b, right? Then you look at this uh, this vector, which is say b minus a or a minus b doesn't matter. A minus b would be opposite direction, 
and then you take the length of that, right? Length of this vector. And that is what you mean by distance between the two points. So given a scalar product, you can immediately define a notion of distance between two vectors. Now in general, not just in the plane, but in general, right? So idea is exactly that. So if, I, if, if you give me two vectors, A and B, then the distance between that, and which, which we'll denote by rho, hmm? this is a distance, the, that's a distance, between, and I will write it like this, rho A, B. This is, by definition, uh, I mean, we can define it like this, is the length of A minus B. Is the, 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 sorry, it's equal to the length of this vector. So what are the uh, uh, things? Uh, first of all, uh, notice that the, uh, this is, uh, it, the order doesn't matter here. I mean, rho of B A is the same as rho of A B because, okay, if, if you want to compute the, uh, for the rho of B A according to this formula, it would be the distance, it, it will be the length of the B minus A. But the length of B minus A is the length of, same as the length of A minus B, right? So this is, remains the same. This is what you would imagine. I mean, given two points, I mean, there's a, the, the distance is just given. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you say uh, di distance between point number one and point number two, or distance between point number two and point number one, the same. So this is the property. Um, the second property is that if, if a distance between two points, A and B, is zero, suppose the distance between two points is zero, hmm? two vectors, between two, partic two particular vectors is zero, then this implies that A equal to B. Right? Because again, by definition, this is the length of A minus B, but the length of A minus B, if it is zero, that can only happen if this vector is zero, but if this vector is zero, then A is equal to B. Right? So that's this. And then the triangular inequality. The distance again satisfies the triangular inequality. I mean, for the same same reason, and that we have already shown. So the, the point is that the notion of distance satisfies these important properties: that the distance is, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter. The distance between point number one and point number two is the same as the one between point two and point one. It's always uh, non-negative. These are always non-negative because the length is always non-negative, right? So this is always non-negative. Okay. And it is zero only if A is equal to B. Right? When A is not equal to B, it is not zero, it's a positive. Okay. And finally, they should satisfy the triangular inequality. Right? These are the basic properties of the distance. It's a, okay, we will not be using this notion of distance so much here, but it's important in topology. I mean, you know, given a space, you always need to know, you need to define what do you mean by nearby points, a neighborhood of, a, of that point, right? Because if you want to set up all the calculus and all that, you need to know the notion of a near points. No? Which point is nearby? So that's crucial. To, to develop all the calculus, differentiation, all this notion, you need that. But we will not be doing it. So I will not be saying more about the distance function. Okay. Just, to, just for you to know that there is this notion. Okay. Now we come to a very important uh, point, which is very useful, I think. It will be very useful for uh, all the quantum mechanics and uh, uh, basically everything which uses vector spaces. And that is uh, the notion of an orthogonal basis. Orthogonal basis. You see, so far we talked about a basis. So what was the basis? Basis was a set of a maximal, a maximal set of linearly independent vectors. And you see, that no, for that notion, I never introduced any metric. There was no notion of a scalar product, right? That was a purely vector space structure. But now we have more structure on that, right? Now we have, we have defined also a scalar product in this. So we can do a bit better than before, right? In other words, you can choose perhaps some particularly nice basis, right? So, so what we'll do is uh, we'll, just, uh, we'll talk about something called orthogonal basis. So first of all, let me define what is an orthogonal vector. What are the orthogonal vectors? If 
if I give you some two vectors a and b which satisfy the condition a with b is 0, okay. then a and b are called orthogonal to each other. So, that is the definition of orthogonal orthogonal to each other. So, in the in the example of the flat in the plane, in the example of plane, if I give you one vector here, and if I go to a perpendicular direction, take so this is say the vector A, and any vector perpendicular to B will be orthogonal, right? Because the dot product will be A length of A times length of B times cosine of that angle, but this is 90 degrees, so cosine of 90 is zero, so this dot product will be zero, right? So in this case, A and B will be orthogonal to each other. So that, that is the idea here. So we do this. So what is now an orthogonal basis? Orthogonal basis is that the basis vectors are all orthogonal to each other. Okay. So if you have n-dimensional space, there will be n basis vectors, right? But we choose a particular set of basis vectors. You remember, in the choice of basis, there is a lot of I mean, lot of freedom there, right? You can choose different bases, right? But uh, an orthogonal basis is that basis vector, the set of those basis vectors which, which are orthogonal to each other. Okay. That's a, so, in particular, for example, in, in the in the two-dimensional case, in the two-dimensional case, you see what do we choose? We don't choose just generally. I mean, uh, I, uh, normally we choose this basis vectors, right? Uh, let me call it uh, one. I mean, I don't know a. Uh, say, I don't know one. Uh, a, okay, and another basis vector which is in the y-axis. This is the x-axis, is the y-axis, right? These are orthogonal to each other. This is what we normally choose. No, we don't choose a. I mean, we don't choose say one of them is that this one, another b. Although you could choose this as a basis vector, there's no problem with that, right? As we saw, these are linearly independent, right? However, it's more convenient for many applications. It's more convenient to use an orthogonal basis where you choose say one of them along the x axis other along the y axis okay it's uh, is much easier um, why is it easier because if i take any vector v if i uh, write it as a linear combination of these two vectors okay let me use the another symbol here e1 and e2 okay uh, two 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 orthogonal vectors so if i write v uh, as a linear combination of e1 plus e2 with some coefficients, what are these coefficients? These coefficients will be just apply uh, take the pro project it. So this will be some x, this length, and if you project here, this will be some length y. Then this will be simply x e1 plus y e2, right? And then v square, the length v dot v, is simply x square plus y square, right? Because why? Because e1 square is one, e2 square is 1 and e1 dot e2 is 0. This is the reason. This is the reason why you have x square plus y square, right? So, it is much more convenient, I mean, you know. Uh, yeah. In fact, in quantum mechanics, you will be many times using the orthogonal basis. So, so that is why it is useful to, I mean, because of this reason. Everything becomes simpler. All the formulae become much simpler if you use orthogonal basis. So, or I will always use the symbol uh, for orthogonal basis in general. So, this will be some E1, E2, E. If it is an n-dimensional space, there will be of course n basis vectors should be n vectors. But now, I am choosing a particular basis vectors such that they are orthogonal to each other. Okay. So, what they satisfy then, let me write down. Okay. So, orthogonal basis satisfies this condition. Ei with Ej is equal to delta Ij. Delta Ij. Kronecker delta. So remember, this is a Kronecker delta. This this will appear all the time. So you should be familiar with this Kronecker delta. I think you already seen it before, right? In the Kronecker delta. So this is uh, equal to one if i is equal to j. It is zero if i is not equal to j. 
That's the definition of conical data. Okay. Any question? You had a question? No. You didn't have any question. Okay. No, I, I thought you were asking a question. No, no, right. okay. Uh, okay. Fine. So, so we want to uh, choose it. So first question you can ask, is it possible to choose it? I mean, for a, given any vector space, is it always possible to choose such a basis? That's the first question you can ask. Answer to that is yes. So there's a theorem. There's a theorem, orthogonalization theorem. Orthogonalization theorem. Or it's also called the uh, Graham-Schmidt procedure. Graham-Schmidt method. So there's a theorem which says that it's always possible to choose an orthogonal basis. Uh, the, the reason why, I mean, the, the proof of the theorem is actually constructive proof, in the, in the sense that the, the proof is given by explicitly constructing it, okay? Or yeah, at least uh, it gives a procedure how to construct it, a method how to construct it, huh? recursively, step by step by step. Huh? And that's why it's also called gram schmidt method, because this gives you a method how to construct orthogonal spaces. Okay. So let me just describe that. So the procedure is actually, actually completely straightforward. Um, well, suppose I'm given some basis, which I call I. This is some, some basis, is, is a basis, which need not be orthogonal, it's just some basis. I goes from one to one. Now, given this basis, which is an arbitrary basis, I want to construct an orthogonal basis. This is the aim, right? This is what we want to do. So how will we do that? Okay, let me take the first one, first vector. Okay. Well, this vector, okay, it's one vector, but its length may not be equal to one, right? Because here you see E1 with E1 is one, right? So its length may not be equal to one. But that's not a big problem. I can always divide by the length, right? I take this vector and divide by the length. Then it will become something of length one, right? So let's define E1 as this divided by uh, square root of the length. I mean, the, uh, the length, square root of one, one with, uh, square root of one with one, okay? This is the length of, this is the length of the first vector, right? So if you define this vector, then clearly E1 with E1 is 1, right? I mean, this is a number, sorry, let me write it like this. Maybe better to write it like that. 1 over square root of 1, 1, 1, okay? This is a number. Huh? So I'm just multiplying that number to this vector, which is again a vector, right? Okay, now this has, it's immediate to check. You can check immediately that E1 with E1 is in fact 1. Why? Because you see, this is a positive number, it's a positive number. So when I take the dual, I have to take the complex conjugate of that, but since it's a, it's a positive number, it's, it's the same. It's a real number, it's the same, right? So you just get the square of this guy, which is one with, uh, with one, one. And then the scalar product of one with one, right? It becomes, because, is it clear? I mean, I, again, I've done two, two steps in one. I mean, there is a, this factor will appear both in the vector E1 and the dual vector, right? So you get the square of this factor, which is why you get that. And then uh, there's a scalar product of this with its dual vector, which is this. And it, this indeed cancels and gives you one. So E1 has been, uh, E1 is of length one. Okay, fine. Now let's go to the, I want to uh, take the vector two. I want to consider the second vector which is orthogonal to that. So what I will do, well, I can take the vector two, okay? But the vector two may, may not be orthogonal to vector one, right? Because as we said, this is an arbitrary basis. This may not be orthogonal. So what should I do? I mean, so again, the intuition, to get an intuition, uh, let me again go to the plane, okay? Uh, let me choose the first vector as that. And the second vector is that. This is linearly independent, 
but it's not orthogonal, mm. right? So what did I do? The first, in the first step, what I did was I first normalized this to length one, right? At the moment, this may not be length one, right? So when I divide by its length, so that this becomes length one, this I call E one, okay? This is length one in some scale, okay, this is length one. Now if I take the second vector, the, I mean the E2 cannot be the, just the second vector because second vector is not orthogonal to that, right? So what should I do? I, sh I can just take it, project it onto the, this axis, right? And subtract from this vector, that vector, you see? Uh, so, okay, let me, uh, the, the, uh, it's a bit, so say, say, say the second vector is that. What I do, I apply the projection. I, I, I uh, draw a perpendicular here. Okay. Then whatever this is, this thing, this vector, you subtract from this vector that vector. When you subtract, so let me call this vector as three, vector number three, from here to here. So take two minus three. Uh, sorry, I'm sometimes using. Okay, let me just use a cat notation. Two minus three. 2 minus 3 will be this vector minus that vector, which will be that vector, right? Now 2 minus 3 is clearly orthogonal to the x-axis, right? So you first construct 2 minus 3, but this may not be of length 1, so once again just divide by the length of this vector, right? So that way you can construct the second orthogonal vector, right? Is that clear or not? Huh? Clear, right? For everyone, it's clear? Yeah. Um, so once again, maybe I should draw the picture a bit bigger. So first vector, I choose this. Okay. The second vector, I choose something like that. This, is, this forms a basis. So this is my first vector, and this is my second vector. Okay. This is a basis, but it's not an orthogonal basis, because the dot product of these two is not zero. So, to, so first of all, I, uh, my, uh, as a first step, I just pick one of these one of these two vectors, and just divide it by the length of that vector to make it length one. Okay, that was a, that was the easy part. Okay, so I, I I just divide by the length of this square root of that, and whatever I get, it will be it I call e one. Okay, you see, it's, it's going to be the same direction as one. I'm just dividing by the length, so it's just the same direction. But now its its length is one. This, this vector's length is one. Now I take the second vector. Second vector is not orthogonal. Uh, but what I can do is I can take the, I draw a perpendicular here. Okay? This will intersect at some point. This will be, uh, and draw this vector, joining this point to that point, origin to that. Okay? Call this vector, vector three. Okay? Now take the difference between the vector two and vector three. That difference will be simply this. This will be the vector two minus vector three, right? Because I mean, the one way to see that this vector plus that vector is equal to that vector, right? So therefore, this must be equal to this will be equal to this minus that. Okay. So this now this vector is going to be orthogonal to e one because this is along the y-axis, right? So this will be uh, orthogonal to that, but now the of course its length may not be equal to one. So to get the second ortho orthonormal vector, I just divide by the length of this. That way I construct the second orthonormal vector. Right? And you keep proceeding. Then once you have the first and two, second vector, take the third vector and find again, remove the projections along the first and second vector, right? Mm -hmm. And get the something which is perpendicular to the first and second. So this you keep going on and on. Okay? This is a recursive kind of procedure. So let's uh, just uh, formalize, uh, write it down. So what is the second vector then? I will first take the vector 2 and subtract from that um, this guy. So E1 vector 2, E1, subtract from that. This is the, this is the analog of the, 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 the dot, yeah, projection, exactly. Projection onto the first direction. You take the second vector, uh, take the projection along this first vector. And then, you see, that is the uh, kind of uh, the length of the projection, right? But then you're taking this, you're drawing this vector along the E1 direction. 
So that's why I have E1 vector. And now I subtract. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is uh, this is what I call vector three. This is vector three. Okay. So let's check first of all. We want to check whether this is orthogonal to E1 or not. Right? Its length is not equal to one yet. But that is the easy part. I can always divide by the length. Hmm? But first of all, let's check whether this is orthogonal to E1. So let's, uh, let's, let's call this some vector, vector I don't know, uh, 2 prime or something, yeah? some vector 2 prime. Call it, yeah? So I want to check whether this is orthogonal to 2 prime, uh, E1 or not. Hmm? So let's uh, do that. What is this? Well, so uh, 2 prime is that. So this is the same as E1 with 2 minus, this is just a number. I'm just using linearity, E1 2, and then E1 with E1. But this guy is 1 that I have already arranged E1 with E1 is 1, right? So this is 1, so this cancels, so you get 0, okay? So we have shown that this, this vector, 2 prime, is indeed orthogonal to E1. The only thing which we don't know, which we still have not arranged, is to make this length equal to 1. But that is simple, so you just define E2 as 2 prime, the vector 2 prime, divided by the length of 2 prime. Okay. The length of 2 prime is simply 2 prime, 2 prime squared. This is the length, right? Okay. That will be now, that gives you a second orthogonal vector. Now you can keep going. Now for the third vector, what I have to do, take the third vector, and then I have to remove from it the projection along the first and second. Okay. So now I can write down a general formula. A general formula. I can write down. So suppose I have, I, I have gone, this, I have done this procedure up to some, I have constructed the first k orthogonal vectors. Hmm? Now I want to construct the k plus 1 -th. This is by induction. This procedure is called induction by induction, you want to prove this. So suppose I have, I have gone through this procedure and constructed the first k orthogonal vectors. Hmm? Now I want to show that then I can construct the k plus 1 -th orthogonal vector. Right? So suppose by this procedure, uh, by this procedure, we have constructed the first k uh, orthogonal vectors. Okay. Um, then, then we want to construct the k plus 1 vector. k plus 1 orthogonal vector. So I'll just write down the formula and then you will see that that is indeed the case. So I will write down EK, uh, EK uh, first of all let me define the k plus 1 prime vector yeah? because this length may not be equal to 1, then I will divide by the length to construct. This will be defined like this, k plus 1 minus um, EI k plus 1 EI where i goes from 1 up to k. You see, I, we said that, suppose we have constructed the first k orthogonal vectors, right? This ei, i goes from 1 to k. These are the orthogonal vectors. Yeah? Then, this is just a projection of the k plus 1th vector along this ei, right? This is the projection. And then, uh, I sum them up and subtract from the original vector. Then, this guy is going to be orthogonal to all of these eis from 1 to k. So let's check that. So we want to check Ej with k plus 1 prime, I mean this vector, uh, where for j, where j is between 1 and k. Because I have defined this only for 1 up to k. So far I've only constructed, under this assumption, I've only constructed the first k. 
objects. So I want to check this uh, expression, this thing, which, well, I again use the linearity. So you get here Ej k plus 1 minus, uh, this is just the numbers. These are the numbers. And then I take the Ej with Ei. Right? But this, we, we are saying uh, both j and i are between 1 and k. So these guys are already orthogonal. So therefore, this is nothing else but the Kronecker delta. Right? Now I sum over i from 1 to k. Only time it will be non-zero is when i is equal to j. And when i is equal to j, this is simply ej with k plus 1, which cancels with that. Okay? So this gives you 0. So indeed, this vector, k plus 1 prime vector that we have constructed, is orthogonal to all the first k orthogonal vectors. Okay. Only thing that is its length may not be equal to 1. Right? So I can divide by the length of this. Right? So then I define the Ek plus 1. Ek plus 1 is equal to the vector k plus 1 prime divided by the length of this vector. Okay. The length of that. And then that becomes of length 1. Right? So this procedure goes on, you can completely, and all the way up to the full, up to the full n. If it's n-dimensional, you can construct this way all the n orthogonal vectors. Right? This is the procedure. Note that in this procedure, um, the uh, e, e k plus oneth vector involves only the k plus oneth vector of the original basis and lower ones because you see in the way we are constructing how we construct I think that's one important point to remember with this Graham Schmidt procedure right you see what did we do e1 was uh, just proportional to 1 was uh, was 1 times some number right divided by the length is a number so it's basically let me just write that proportional to 1 right it was it's just uh, this is simply this divided by the length of that so okay e2 is a linear combination remember how we obtained that this was simply 2 minus uh, e1 2 with 1 divided by again the length of this vector i mean so length length of that vector okay but notice so what is it the only two vectors which are entering here is 2 and 1 is a linear combination of second and first vector right now you go to the 3 in this procedure this we start with again 3 minus uh, uh, e, e1 with 3 times e1 sorry this is e1 now. e1 is again proportional to 1 so this is again 1 right? e1 plus uh, uh, e2 dot 3 e2 with 3 e2 this divided again by the length of this whole thing, right? This is the procedure, the length of this whole thing. Now, what, what, what vectors are involved here? E1 only involves the first vector. E2 involves the first and second vector. So this guys involve the first and second vectors altogether, and that's the third vector. So E3 is a linear combination of the first three basis vectors here, 1, 2, and 3, right? Similarly, if you go to E4, it will be the linear combination of the first four vectors. So like that. It's a... So in general, E k will involve the first k vectors of this, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a, that's why it's a recursive kind of procedure. You just take step by step from here, these vectors, right? Finally, of course, the E n will be a linear combination of all the n vectors. That's the idea. So, so this, is the, this is the procedure. Of course, I mean, this procedure is fine. I mean, you can use it for finite dimensional cases, right? Because in finite dimensional, because as you see, this is a recursive step, right? Uh, so if it's a finite dimensional space, after some amount of work, maybe an hour or two hours of work, you can get the full orthogonal basis, right? But if it's infinite dimensional spaces, it's not very useful, right? You have to find other ways of doing it. But, but what this sh shows is that in principle, it is possible to construct orthonormal orthonom basis, right? You wouldn't use this to ever to construct in the function space. 
which is infinite dimensional space, you will not use this method to construct the you know orthonormal basis. You will find some other ways of doing it. But what this shows is that it is it's possible. There exists an uh, orthonormal basis. For, for finite dimensional cases, you do use this procedure because it will just take a finite amount of time to construct the orthonormal basis. Uh, yeah, okay. Let me see. Okay, we will come back to. Um, let me see what I could do. Um, yeah, let me. Yeah, okay, since I am talking about it, maybe I can say at this point something before I move to the linear operators. Um, you see, before I said that uh, if I give you an arbitrary, uh, some basis, right, if I, I you may pick up another basis. And the relation between these two bases is given by uh, basically an n by n matrix, which is usually called the transformation matrix. But the important point of that matrix was that that matrix was uh, had determinant not equal to zero, which means it was invertible matrix. Okay, that was the important point here. Uh, now you can ask the following question: Suppose I have constructed an orthonormal basis. You construct another orthonormal basis, right? What is the relation between these two bases? These two orthonormal bases now, not arbitrary bases, but orthonormal bases. Okay. So we can ask that question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I mean, uh, usually when you say orthogonal, you don't worry about normalizing the length to one. When you say orthogonal, you just mean that the uh, scalar product of any or, uh, any two different ones is zero. But you don't necessarily mean that the length of each of them is one, right? But I, when I say orthogonal, I really mean orthonormal, okay? Orthonormal. So I've also normalized the length to one, right? because that step is a trivial step. I mean, one I think most difficult step is to make it perpendicular, uh, everything orthogonal to each other. Once you have made orthogonal, then it's a matter of just scaling the, by the length, no? Dividing by the length to make it, uh, yeah, yeah. So really, what I mean, actually, what I, I'll be using all with orthonormal. This is the same as orthonormal in that sense, okay. because going from orthogonal to orthonormal is a very trivial step. Okay. Just to normalize the lengths to one, okay. that's the only thing. Um, yeah. So so let's see. Uh, so suppose I'm given a, a, a orthonormal basis, E i. I going from 1 to n. And there is another orthonormal basis, Ei prime. I mean, somebody else has given, chosen another orthonormal basis. And we want to ask what is the relation between them. Okay. Well, uh, since these are basis vectors, as before, I can always expand each of these guys in terms of these basis vectors. Right? Um, actually, um, uh, maybe I should have also mentioned this. Yeah. Actually, even before doing this, uh, let's uh, see what is nice about this ortho orthonormal basis is that you can very easily expand any vector in terms of this orthonormal basis. Okay? So take any vector A. Okay. I want to expand it in terms of this orthonormal basis. Okay. Uh, the claim is that this, this is nothing else but uh, this quantity, uh, E i A. E i, summed over i, which is exactly what you would do. See, this is the projection of the vector a along the e i direction, and then you uh, multiply by the vector e i and sum it up. How do you prove that? Well, let's uh, prove this. Uh, let's look at uh, e j. Uh, let's apply e j with a. I want to. Uh, I want to check whether this is true or not. I want to check this is true or not. So let's uh, uh, let's multiply by E j on both sides. Let's take the scalar product on both sides. Okay. Well, this side you have that, whereas this side you get E i a. This is just a number. Then E j with E i summed over i equal to one to n, but that's Kronecker delta. Okay. And then then so this is the, this is Kronecker delta. 
delta j i okay and then this in the sum the only term you should contribute is i equal to j and and that term term you get e j a but that's the same on both sides okay so it's um, so therefore this is indeed true so it's a very simple exp uh, expansion i mean for any basis of course i know i mean this a i can expand in any in this basis and coefficient there will be some coefficients right i call usually i just call them ai right but what i'm saying in orthonormal basis uh, these coefficients are just simply given by the scalar product of a with the orthonormal vectors right? so that's the that's the idea I mean, it's a very simple expression, a very explicit expression in terms of scalar product. Okay, so so let's uh, do this here. Um, e i prime, I can always expand in terms of e i, uh, in terms of this old basis vectors. So it will be some uh, coefficient. Let me call it r i j e j, some over j equal to one. Right. This is what. I mean, uh, this is the kind of matrix I was using for a gen arbitrary basis. Right? Of course, also in particular, I mean, after all, this is also a basis, it's just orthonormal basis. So I, I can always write E i prime as a linear combination of E j for each i. Right? So, and those are the coefficients. Okay. So now, uh, let us see. Um, but you see, this is not an arbitrary basis. We are saying that this is an orthonormal basis. Right, so they must satisfy E i prime with E j prime is Kronecker delta. Right, so let us see what that implies on this matrix. So let's compute. Uh, first of all, what is the dual uh, E i prime? The dual, dual is simply the duals of this, but I have to take the complex conjugate of these numbers. Remember, the dual is when you go from the uh, uh, when you take the dual, it's anti-linear map, right? I mean, remember, I mean, uh, remember this statement. If the dual of A is, I denote by that, and the dual of B, I denote by this, then the dual of alpha A plus beta B is alpha bar, alpha star, complex conjugate, A plus beta bar B, right? This is anti-linear map. So, so the dual E i prime would be simply this guy, j equal to 1 to n, r bar j i e j, where e j are the dual of, of the e j here, right? This is a anti-linear map. Okay. So now let's, uh, let's just uh, take E i prime with e, j, e k prime, let's say. E i prime with E k prime, scalar product. Well, uh, so first of all, uh, I can, uh, I mean, so, so what do we get here? So here you have uh, maybe too many, maybe, uh, uh, let's see, I can, um, no, so, so let, let's do the following. I mean, not to, this, I keep this i, uh, this guy I put here k, okay, k, and here, so this is k, and here I put here l, okay. I mean, not to use the same index. That uh, otherwise, the, if you, I mean, when you use these indices, you have to be careful. Huh? Uh, I mean, okay, I, I, I will come to that one second. Uh, so, so I, I, this e, e k prime is that. So we have l equal to one to n r bar l k. Then you have e l. Okay. Similarly, for e i prime, I have that expression, which is j equal to one to n r j i. And then we have E L with E J. Correct. That's the. I mean, I had taken. I've done several steps in the in one step, but I think by now you should be familiar with that, right? Yeah, I'm just using linearity, on in both arguments, in this and that. Okay, but this guy is Kronecker delta, because I the old basis, this basis. I mean, actually both the bases are orthogonal, orthonormal, right? So this is Kronecker delta. So what we find here is, this is n equal to one to n, uh, j equal to one to n, uh, one to uh, n, and then we have r bar, l k, r j i, and delta j, delta l j. 
right? So I can, for example, sum over L, L equal to 1 to N, then the only contribution will come when L is equal to J. And in that case, the result is simply this L replaced by J. Right? So, this, so one sum I can do because of the conical delta. So this is the same as J equal to 1 to N, R bar JK, R J I. And this whole thing is supposed to be equal to delta Ki. Right? Because the, the new basis is also orthonormal. So you see this matrix R, this matrix R which defines a transformation between these two bases is a very special matrix. It, it satisfies this condition. So I, I think one way to write this, uh, you remember what we said, we were, write, we were thinking of this as J labeling the row and I labeling the column. Right? That, as I said, that's a matter of convention, but let's fix this convention. I will take this J to be the row and I to be the column. Then this um, then this of this thing is simply I can uh, write this as uh, maybe uh, let me write it here. So uh, let's say R. I define, let me define the matrix R as this. So remember J is the column, right? Uh, J is the row. So you have R one one, R one two, R one n, right? So the top uh, the J index is the is the row. Then you have R21, R22, R2n. Similarly, Rn1 up to Rnn. Right? So I'm writing of this all these coefficients I'm putting together in an n by n matrix. Okay. Then what is R dagger? R uh, dagger. You know, you remember the uh, definition of uh, dagger? Transpose. Yeah. So this is the same as, uh, first you take the complex conjugate, okay, and then take the transpose. I just write it as T. T means transpose. Transpose means exchanging the row and column. So that matrix will be, uh, let's write down explicitly. When I take the complex conjugate, I just take the complex conjugate of each of these guys, and then I exchange. Okay. So the row and column. So this becomes R bar 1, 1. Uh, this becomes R bar 2, 1 and uh, so on, R bar N1. Uh, here, this will become, this will come there. So you get here R bar uh, 1, 2, R bar 2, 2, and so on, and R bar uh, N2. And finally, the last one will be R bar 1N, R bar 2N, all the way up to R bar N. Okay. This is what is R dagger. And now let's take the product of these two matrices, okay? R dagger with R as a matrix multiplication. Okay? So R dagger with R will be, so let's see what it is. So the first element will be this with that. Okay? So you get, okay, let me just write the one, one component, or let's say IJ component of that, or, J, or K, uh, KL component of that, KL. Kth row and Nth. In a column. So I take the kth row and multiply it to the lth column. Okay. So kth row will be uh, r bar uh, 1 uh, k, okay, kth row, uh, and then uh, lth column will be, what is it? the L will be down here, right? r bar, uh, r l 1 plus r bar 2 k R two L and so on, right? R bar N K R N L, right? I'm taking the uh, the the kth row here, kth row, and multiplying term by term the lth column. So the first one, so let me just write explicitly here. So, so there will be kth kth row will be this, kth row will be R bar one K, R bar two K, R bar N K, right? Whereas lth column here, let me write lth column, will be R1 L, R2 L, all the way to R and L. So this is the lth column. And that's the kth row. So I take the kth row and multiply it to the lth column. So the first term is R bar 1 K, R1 L. 
second term is r bar 2k r 2l huh? and so on. So, this is the sum which is the same I can write it in the summation formula. So, this is r bar j k r bar r l r uh, j l summed over j right j equal to 1 j equal to 2 or the j equal to 1. But that is exactly that. So, what we are seeing is this term, this object is nothing else but the, uh, the, the element of the R dagger A which appears in the kth row and lth column. Okay. But left hand side, this sorry, this, this is, no, this is I, sorry, this is I, not L, this is I. So, I should here put I, ith column. Okay. Okay. So, this is all I. I, I read there L instead of I. So, okay. so what we are saying is this is the, uh, uh, this what appears there is simply the, you take the R dagger A, R, the ma matrix product of R, R dagger with R and pick up the kth row and ith column, right? That is what appears on the right hand side. Whereas left hand side is the saying is Kronecker delta, but Kronecker delta means it's a unit matrix, right? In the, if you take the unit matrix and look at the kth row and ith column, that is delta ki, Kronecker delta. So, we have the equation, that equation is simply r dagger a r is equal to identity matrix, n by n identity matrix. That is that equation I am saying. Okay. So, what this is telling you is that if I make a transformation from one orthonormal basis to another orthonormal basis given by this matrix r, then that matrix is not an arbitrary matrix. It satisfies this condition R dagger R is equal to 1, 1 meaning identity matrix. Yeah? Such matrices which satisfy this condition are called unitary matrices. There is a name for these matrices. They are called unitary matrices. Okay? So, write it this way. Um, Some just the definition. So, matrices, so n by n matrices, let us say n by n matrices that satisfy the condition R dagger R is equal to identity matrix. I mean, I am using this uh, block one to indicate that this is matrix, matrix one. Uh, okay. Then such matrices are called uh, are called unitary matrices. Okay. They are very important. These unitary matrices are very important. Okay. Um, <coughs> note that I mean uh, uh, there are some very nice features of that. Okay. First of all, what this means that the inverse of R is R dagger. Right? So, R dagger is the inverse of R. Uh, second important point is that if I give you two unitary matrices, let us say R1 and R2, you can ask the following question. Is the product of these two matrices unitary or not? Okay? So, take uh, say R1 and suppose R1 and R2 are unitary. Question is, is R1 times R2, is it unitary or not? That is a question. So, let us check it. So, what I want to take, I take R1, R2 and multiply from the left the dagger of that. So, I want to take consider R1, R2 dagger R1, R2. Matrix multiplication, these are all matrix multiplications. But you know that when I take the dagger, they go, the order changes. Is that, is, do you, are you familiar with that? Right? So, if I open this up, this becomes R2 dagger, R1 dagger times R1 R2. Okay? But now, R1 dagger with R1 is 1, because R1 we said is unitary. Right? So, this is the same as R2 dagger times R2, because here, here this is identity matrix. 
right? So it's R2 diagram. But this is again unitary, so this is the identity matrix. Okay? So product of two unitary matrices is again unitary. But that you should have expected. Why? Because you see, one unitary matrix took you from one orthonormal basis to another orthonormal basis. Then the second one, when you apply, that takes you to the, this, the, so in other words, so let's say from EI by applying R1, I go to some EI prime basis. These are orthonormal. Right? Then I apply R2 to go to some EI double prime and even yet another orthonormal basis. So when I apply these two together, that is like going from here to there directly. But after all, this is again a transformation from orthonormal to orthonormal. So that must be also unitary, right? So it's not surprising that this product is unitary. Both R1, R2 or R2, R1, doesn't matter which order. It's still, you go to from orthonormal basis to orthonormal basis, right? So, um, yeah. Uh, and uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, that, that's this one property. And the property is that uh, the inverse of a Inverse of a unitary matrix is again unitary, which is obvious, right? So uh, R inverse, if R is unitary, if R is unitary, then R inverse is also unitary. Okay, easy to see. Well, R inverse, I want to take R inverse dagger with R inverse. I want to check whether this is this is unit matrix or not. But uh, when you take the R inverse dagger, that is simply R dagger um, inverse. I can exchange times R inverse. But this is the same as R R dagger inverse. Okay. But R times R dagger is inverse of R. So R R dagger is one, right? So this is the inverse of the identity which is identity, okay? So this also. So uh, this is a very special thing that you have, so the, what we are saying is that if you take the set of all n cross n matrices, the set of all n cross n unitary matrices, okay? Then the product of any two such matrices inside the set will again give you another element of the same set, right? Furthermore, in, in this set, there is also the inverse. I mean, if, a, if a, an element exists, its inverse exists, of course, identity vector, identity matrix also is a special unitary matrix. I mean, the identity matrix obviously satisfies this condition. If you take identity times identity dagger, that's identity, of course, right? So this such a set which has these properties is called a group. It's a, it's a definition of a group, okay? So what we are seeing is that this is, this is called a unitary group, by the way, because it's, all, it's a group consisting of unitary matrices. You call this and usually you denote this group by U n. U stands for unitary, n stands for this n by n. Right? So such a group is called unitary, unitary group of n by n matrices. So what we are learning here is that uh, if you take an n-dimensional vector space and consider this, um, uh, start from one orthonormal basis, and you, then you look at all possible uh, uh, transformations to another orthonormal basis, those are given by unitary matrices. And the set of all these unitary matrices forms a group, right? which is called unitary group. That's one thing. The second thing, uh, this is very important because um, um, under the unitary transformation, uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, I mean, why is it important? Because in quantum mechanics, you will see that, uh, for example, all the time evolution operator, time evolution. So given a state, suppose I start with initial state, quantum mechanical state, you evolve in time, right? You'll wait for some time and see how the state develops, right? Okay, it will be some other state in general, right? If there's some non-trivial dynamics, it'll be some other state. But the important point is that other state will have the same norm with, the, with all the other, the scalar product with all everything else, okay? Which means that the, 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 the transformation which takes you from initial state to final state is a unitary transformation, okay? It will be unitary matrix. I mean, of course, it will be infinite dimensional. In quantum mechanics, it's a space is infinite dimensional, but nevertheless, it will be a unitary operator. Time evolution operator is a unitary operator, okay? So unitary operators play a very, very important role in 
in quantum mechanics. Okay. This is unitary matrix because I'm talking about finite dimensional cases. All right. So now, uh, so this is the, I think, um, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, we will come back to this uh, more also, uh, perhaps later. But let me. Uh, is there any question here? Is there any question? By the way, if it was a real, I mean, this was I'm always talking about complex vector spaces, right? But if it was real vector spaces, then these matrices R will be real, right? Uh, in that case, uh, the, com the complex conjugation does nothing, right? So this equation will simply become R transpose R, because dagger is the complex conjugation and transpose, but complex conjugation does nothing, because the real matrix, right? So uh, this equation becomes R transpose R equal to one. Okay, and R transpose R equal to one. I mean, the mat real matrices will satisfy that condition. Those matrices are called orthogonal matrices. Orthogonal matrices. Okay, and you are familiar with it. Uh, I think you uh, from the geometry, the planar geometry. You already know these matrices. For example, uh, so let's con so I'm, let's see in the real case in the case of real vectors real vector spaces. Uh, R is real, R, the matrix R is real. And then this equation, R dagger R is the same as R transpose R. Right? Because complex conjugation is the same, doesn't do anything, because the matrix is real. So this is equal to identity. So such matrices are called orthogonal matrices. Orthogonal matrices. Okay. So this is orthogonal matrix, n cross n orthogonal matrices. And uh, this again, you can show this forms a group. Product of two, two orthogonal matrices will again be orthogonal. You can go through the entire proof. And this group is called ON, orthogonal group. ON. Group. Yeah? So to, to just to uh, make uh, to to show to you that you have you have already seen these groups, let's consider n equal to two case, two dimensional space, two dimensional real vector space. So in two dimensional, so take n equal to two case. So I have a this is my plane, two dimensional, and I choose an orthonormal basis. So let's say the usual x axis and y axis, with the length one. So this is one vector. That's another vector, length one. Okay. These are the. This is e one and e two. Now, suppose I choose. I want to choose another basis, which is orthonormal. How how would you do this? Well, suppose I can rotate. I rotate this whole thing. There's one way to get in, right? I can rotate by an angle theta, so that this e one goes to this e one prime, and this e two. Let me write e two is here. E2 will become like that, right? E2 prime. And this angle is theta. theta. Okay. And you can see what is this. I mean, you can write down what is this is E1 prime. Sorry. So E1 prime is simply, you can see what it is. It's if you project it, this becomes cosine theta times E1. So cosine theta times E1 plus sine theta times E2. Right? If you project it this way, uh, this projection will be sine of theta, right? And e2 prime, because uh, I mean there's no other number because e1 prime uh, length is one. Remember, e2 prime will be see e2 prime is this one. So when I project along the first axis, it's in the negative direction. So you get here minus sine theta e1 plus cosine theta e2. Which in the matrix language you can write like this. So E1 prime, the way we introduce the matrix E1 prime, E2 prime. This is the same as cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta, E1, E2. So this is the matrix R in this case. And indeed you can check that this is orthogonal. Okay. So this is R. So R transpose is simply uh, 
cos theta. I have to exchange these two, right? So minus sin theta, sin theta, cos sin theta. And I multiply with this, I mean this with that. So first row with the first column, you get cos square theta plus sin square theta, which is 1. Now take this guy with the second column. This becomes cos theta sin theta. And this minus sin theta cos theta cancels. right? So off diagonal term is 0. And similarly, you can check with this. right? So indeed, you can show that R transpose R is 1. Is a two by two unit matrix. Uh, this is, um, but you see, uh, it's not just a rotation. I mean, rotation is one way to get an ortho another orthonormal basis. But you could also do a parity transformation. You know what is a parity transformation? Just reflect. So, for example, reflect uh, along this. So, reflect everything about this axis. So, e1 goes to minus e1, right? But e2 remains the same. That's another. That's again gives you an orthonormal basis, right? So the full, this is the full O2 group, this O2 orthogonal group, 2 by 2 uh, matrix, consists of two types of transformations. One is a rotation, okay, and other is a parity, reflection, reflection and rotations. In general, this ON is again the same thing, but now you have to consider all possible rotations in n-dimensional space. So, for example, if you take n equal to 3, O3, so our real three space-time space, space dimensions, uh, space dimensions, uh, it will be all rotations in three-dimensional space, together with all possible reflections. That is what this group is. Okay. That is the meaning of this group. The rotation, rotation group together with the parity, the, the reflection. Hmm. So, uh, okay. Uh, can I, uh, let's see how much more, maybe, at least let me introduce the concept of linear, if you don't have any questions here, uh, let me introduce this concept of linear operators, because that is now the main thing, yeah, I mean, so far it was all just, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, so now I will describe discuss something called linear operators. Okay, we have vector space. We have we have even a scalar product inside this vector space. And now we want to study various operations on this vector space. Hmm? Actually, these were particular examples of that. I mean, these uh, R matrices and so on. Those are certain examples of transformations. Here, you know, you ap you apply this on some vector, it will give you again another vector. Right, the, the, but so let's define it more generally. So we have linear operators. I will I will just define it, and I will not. I will just stop after that. So the, the notion of linear operators. Well, we have already seen an example of this. Um, so so more generally. So let me define. It. So let's say S is a vector space, and. Uh, uh, let's say, I don't know, something else, give a name to that. Some V is another vector space. So these are two vector spaces. S and V are vector spaces. So in general, you can define an operation. So you, you, you define a linear operator, let's call it A. A is a linear operator. What it does, it, ta it maps S to V. So it takes, a, for every element of S, it gives a rule to, uh, to associate an element of V. But it should be also linear. This is the important point, linear. Right? So what it means is that A acting on, say, two vectors, uh, say, sum of two vectors, alpha A plus beta V here, 
will be the same as alpha a acting on a plus beta a acting on b. This is a linear, linear operator. This, this is an element of that. This is an element of that. Right? And I'm saying a, a maps vectors of s to vectors of b. Right? So this is an element of that. This is an element of that. Linear combination of these two is again an element of that. And the particular thing we have already studied when we define the dual vector spaces was linear functions. So what is special about linear functions? In the linear function, this V is just a set of real numbers, set of complex numbers. Okay, we were talking set of complex numbers, which, uh, which is an example of a vector space. After all, the set of complex numbers is a vector space, or set of real numbers for that matter is a vector space. Okay, you can check. The, just the, it's a one-dimensional set of real numbers is a one real dimensional vector space. Set of complex numbers is a uh, one complex dimensional vector space again. You can check that they all sat they satisfy all the conditions. Yeah, please check that. Huh? Uh, check that the set of complex numbers is a, is a complex, is a vector space is a complex vector space of dimension one. Right? This is a complex dimension one. So I mean you can check that. So that's a so what I defined before in the, for the define to do, define the dual vector space, it was just a special case of this, where this V was this particular vector space. But now we are generalizing this concept. Okay. Uh, this uh, from S to V. V is an arbitrary vector space. Uh, so th this is an important point. This, uh, this is a map from S to V, which is linear map. Okay, this is an important point here. Now, uh, in fact, what we will be doing is uh, actually in most of the most in most of the physical applications, really. Uh, the, the, what it appears is when V is e actually equal to S itself, okay? Yeah, See, so this, this is defined for any V, for any S and any V. Hmm? But what appears in physical applications mostly is a case when V is a and S are the same, okay? So, for example, in quantum mechanics, this S will be the Hilbert space of states, of physical states. And A will be all the possible operators, Hamiltonian or whatever operators you have. When they act on the uh, vector, uh, uh, state, it will give you again a state in the same Hilbert space, right? So, so for, in, in particular in quantum mechanics, the application which appears is when S is equal to V. S is equal to V. So the special case is when V and S are the same, V is equal to S, so that the map is from S to itself. Okay. Uh, so, so this is the basic definition. And once again, you see, for a finite dimensional case, uh, you can, once you choose a basis, once you choose a basis, so for a finite dimensional case, let's say n dimensional case, you, once you choose a basis, one, uh, uh, two, et cetera, not necessarily orthonormal, just choose any basis, hmm? linearly independent, of course, that's the definition of any basis. Then I can always, uh, so I can ask the question, what happens if I look at A acting on I, ith basis vector? Then of course this will be again some vector of S, right? Because uh, I'm considering not this case where A maps S to S, right? So this is again a vector of S. Therefore, I should be able to expand it in the same basis, right? So it will be si again some J and A J I, some lower J. Yeah, and these are the coefficients, whatever the numbers are, some complex numbers in general. So you see, you can re represent A in ter terms of, again, an n by n matrix, where i goes from 1 to n and j goes from 1 to n, right? 
So once again, uh, it depends on the convention, but uh, maybe the convention uses J is the row and I is the column. Hmm? Okay. So, the, so and this, this numbers define completely define to you how A acts on an arbitrary vector, right? Because an arbitrary vector A is simply A i i with some coefficients i, right? Uh, and then you can see that A acting on A is a uh, use linearity, is a linearity property. So that is some i equal to 1 to n, A i, uh, A acting on i, which is summed i equal to 1 to n, A i, A j, A j i j right i just use this this formula so there's a double sum here now j equal to 1 to n and i equal to 1 to n okay so if uh, so uh, i mean this object will be uh, some new vector i mean after I apply this again i can rewrite it as some a prime let's say huh? a prime uh, j J, right? I mean, this is after all again a vector. Okay. So I can again expand on this basis, right? Now comparing these two, you see what happens. This A prime J is nothing else but A J I A I. Yeah? Okay. In the matrix notation, uh, so, so let me write it. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm being fast here because we have seen this many times. In, you know, in, in different situations, we have seen this kind of. Uh, it's, it's many times, so you should, should be familiar by now. So uh, let me uh, write, arrange these things as a column vector, a1, a2, a3, a n. Call this as a, column vector a. Similarly, a prime is uh, a1 prime, a2 prime, a n prime, and a, write it as this uh, matrix. So A11, A12, A1n. You see J is the, the upper index is the, I'm taking the upper index as the row. And the lower index is the column. Then th that equation, I can write it as a matrix equation. A prime equal to A matrix equation. So these are column vectors, n column vectors. And uh, this is the n by n matrix. So this is the n by n matrix. This is n rows and one column. So n cross one matrix. And this is also n cross one matrix. So the, the matrix multiplication, you see this product is again gives you that. Okay. So, so this is the. So the upshot is that uh, for in finite dimensional cases, if you choose a basis, the, the vector space itself can be represented as a n column vector. Right? You see, any vector, any vector A, I can expand like this and just arrange these coefficients in a column, right? Then that represents a, any arbitrary vector. I mean, by changing these numbers, you get different vectors, right? So the vector space is isomorphic or represented by just a column vector, n, n dimensional column vector, right? If you start with the n dimensional vector. Once it, this, of course, choosing a basis. Right? And the linear operators, again in that basis, are represented by n by n matrices. Right? So uh, matrices are completely general. I mean, in some sense, for any finite dimensional vector space, any linear operator can be expressed as an n by n matrix once you choose a basis. So therefore, in the next time, next, actually next week I won't be here, uh, uh, but the week after. Uh, we will continue with this. Eh? So we will st start studying the matrices in much more detail now. Hmm?